Hey listeners, it's Paul Andriola here. Why not join our community at Small Cap Discoveries where we offer our members direct access to some of the best microcap investment opportunities available. Our members are getting access to premium microcap financings, research reports, and direct access to management. Sign up today at www.smallcapdiscoveries.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today on our call, we have Dave Kohler, the CEO, and Andrew Patient, the CFO of Mimi's Rock. Mimi's Rock trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol MIMI Mimi and on the OTC under MIMNF. The company is trading at 32 cents with roughly 53 million shares outstanding or about a $17 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andrilla. Hey, thanks, Trevor. Um, great to have Andrew and Dave here. Uh, Mimi's Rock, uh, we talked to you guys probably three, four weeks ago, really got a good idea of what you guys are all about. Um, happy to have you here to explain to our listeners uh, what Mimi Rock does and uh, where you guys are going. Um, I'll turn it over to you. I've got, I understand there's a presentation. Trevor's going to set that up for us here. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Trevor. So one of the first questions we always get asked is why Mimi's Rock? Uh, we're not a mining play. So, uh, but there is an actual Mimi's Rock, which is the, the stone you see in the picture. Um, my co-founder and I actually cottage together and that rock uh, is in the bay near us. And uh, I know it sounds kind of romantic, but we were walking on the beach when we decided to put this business together. So we named the corporate entity Mimi's Rock. Mimi's Rock uh, houses a number of online brands in the health and wellness space. Uh, we do vitamin supplements and skincare. We sell exclusively online. So if you could maybe flip some slides for me, Trevor, that would be great. Uh, nod to the lawyers. So the the foundation of Mimi's Rock is, is built on a couple of things, but primarily it was the belief, this is uh, in 2018 when we started the company, that e-commerce was the future and that the future was upon us. Uh, we recognized that uh, retail was evolving quickly. I come out of a consumer packaged goods background and was seeing uh, consumers drift from traditional bricks and mortar to e-commerce at, at a fairly alarming rate. And an opportunity came along for us to acquire our founding brand, which was the Dr. Tobias brand of supplements and minerals uh, founded in Germany uh, and make that acquisition. And what I loved about it then and still to this day was that it was positioned as an e-commerce play an asset light business where the founder had used the proprietary formulations manufactured by third parties uh, and was selling exclusively at the time in the United States. So we saw a business that was really well positioned at a couple of major intersections that we were witnessing, that I was witnessing in my business life, uh, as I say, in consumer packaged goods, which was that drift of consumers and the advent of CMOs or third party manufacturing partners. So we found a business that was really well positioned and, and ultimately scalable. As I said, the original founder was only selling in the United States and only on amazon.com. So we saw it was a tremendous opportunity for growth into different jurisdictions and different portals and different uh, product families within that brand. And then ultimately we, we added on some additional brands which we acquired in the skincare space. Those would be all natural advice and maritime naturals. We, we brought those on in the end of 20, 2019, excuse me. So we now have uh, the three core brands, Dr. Tobias, All Natural Advice and Maritime Naturals, which we sell again exclusively online. Uh, slide please. So we have, uh, as I said, a suite of products, um, which is fantastic, um, well positioned, well, you know, we, we see the compound annual growth rates in the wellness supplements and skincare lines are excellent uh, internationally. What we saw was an opportunity to really bring some discipline to the business when we purchased it. The founder did a, a tremendous job in creating uh, loyal customers and good products, but when you get to things like operational excellence, uh, financial excellence, uh, planning, promotions, these things take a little more discipline than the, what we saw in the original business we acquired. So we brought uh, a more robust product and, and uh, forecasting process and protocol into play so that we would be able to ensure that we avoid the two major faux pas in the online selling world. One would be back ordering products and scattering your customers to to other suppliers. And, and the other would be uh, writing off inventory because you have excess. 
So the, the discipline around operating uh, an online business is critical. So we were able to put that layer in place and we thought do a really good job of building and growing the structure of the organization to allow us to scale. We took a, a business that was growing and profitable and have since added on significant revenue lines uh, and, and continued with profitability as we've gone. So we see that, you know, as a, a, a micro cap company, Miami's Rock is, uh, we believe, undervalued, although I'm sure every CEO that comes on here will tell you that about his company. What, what we know is that when we look at the comps in our space, when we look at the growth that's available in the broader sector, we think there's a tremendous opportunity for investors to get great value in this space with us. We have uh, you know, the ability to add on uh, portals, jurisdictions and geographies at relatively low cost. And I say that in reference to things like more traditional bricks and mortar retail, where you can imagine to enter a new marketplace, to enter a new country, setting up operations there would be very expensive. From just setting up a single bricks and mortar store would cost more than it costs us to enter a marketplace. We can reuse digital assets. We do it all electronically from Canada and we can manage to enter into these new markets and have done so. We'll go through some of these additional portals and expansions that we've been on this journey in the last few years, but um, I'll, I'll move through that as we, as we go through the deck. So next slide, please, Trevor. So as I touched on, what we see is um, strong growth in the sector in general. Dietary supplements are in, in high demand. Uh, the aging population seems to be taking more personal interest in their health and wellness. We're seeing growth in global e-commerce sales. And this is prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, what we've seen uh, through the, the uh, unfortunate global pandemic is that more of an acceleration of e-commerce as a more standardized form of, of buying for many, many consumers. You know, we could all, I'd say, anecdotally recognize that millennials are, are quick to the internet for buying pro their day-to-day -day products they need. What we've seen, uh, particularly in the last year, year and a half, is that all walks of life are, uh, have moved out of the internet. They recognize the ease and the, the uh, cost. Prior to the pandemic, we expect that we will see even more robust growth. Uh, next slide, please. So we look at the North American uh, vitamins and supplements industry, we've seen uh, projected steady growth for the last decade or so. And we believe, as I said, that that will continue. Moving on, Trev. Um, so as I said, when we started the business, the, uh, the, the foundational brand was the Dr. Tobias product family that was sold exclusively on amazon.com. We saw that with relative ease, we could expand that dramatically and uh, you know, flash forward three years, We've expanded, we're now selling on Amazon.ca, Amazon in the UK. We're selling in Italy, Australia, and parts of Europe. Uh, we're also selling on walmart.com, not Walmart on shelf, uh, both in Canada and the US. We have product sales in South Korea through distributors there, uh, Coupang, which you may or may not have heard of, it's an online selling portal in South Korea. As well, we're now uh, through distributors in the Far East as well. We've got our toe in the Japanese market. And, uh, you know, we're looking at others as well, United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia and such. And as I said earlier, what we can do is we can take the digital assets of our products uh, and relatively easily upload them. So it's a matter of setting up operations, it's a matter of distribution, which, as you would all know, through, you know, advanced logistics and, and global networks now, it's relatively speaking easy to do, even from remote locations. So we've taken uh, a core brand that was doing well, but only sold on one portal in one jurisdiction. And we've now expanded to three different brands, uh, two skincare lines, the vitamin supplement line, and of course, portals now all over the world. So the scaling uh, continues. We see there's still opportunities with some other small, interesting, uh, you know, niche portals that we can get into as well. And, and of course, many other countries, in fact, uh, any jurisdiction where the consumers have you know, good family wealth or family incomes. Uh, we're seeing all over the world, people are taking responsibility for their own health and wellness. Next, please, Trevor. So uh, to dig a little deeper into some of the brands I mentioned, the Dr. Tobias brand, which was a core foundational brand, those are consumable primarily uh, uh, supplements and vitamins. We have a few products there. We have a, a pet line. 
Uh, we also have a wide array of, of uh, vitamins and minerals. Um, our top two sellers uh, would be the omega-3 fish oil and a product called the Colon Cleanse, which do very, very well for us. In the skincare businesses, we have a, a number of um, primarily facial focused products, but there's also things for hair and beard care. Vitamin C serum is a top seller from the All Natural Advice line. In fact, it's the top seller on Amazon.ca. And we also have a line called Maritime Naturals. A top selling product there is a, a moisturizing retinol cream, which is very popular and is now being sold in Canada, the US and, and Europe as well. Trevor? Um, most people are familiar with e-commerce, but I can give you a little crash course here. Uh, What's important, um, what's really important are ratings and reviews. So anybody can list a product on Amazon, for example, uh, but we have uh, you know, a poor taste joke that sometimes <laughs> permeates the office. We say, if you wanted to kill somebody, where should you hide the body? Say, on the 10th page at Amazon, because no one ever looks there. So what's important is to have uh, strong reviews and ratings. So what we've featured here on this slide, a few products, a few of our top sellers I touched on earlier, the Omega-3 and the Colon Cleanse. As you can see, the Omega-3, you know, with almost 21,000 reviews and a four and a half star rating and an Amazon's choice banner. So what that means is consumers who consider a product will log on, for example, if they do a search for Omega-3 fish oil, they'll see an array of them placed based upon a number of different uh, variables, but ratings and reviews are absolutely currency in the online world. So consumers who haven't necessarily purchased our product before will recognize that many of their colleagues have and have generally reported excellent results. So the fact that we have products with these kinds of ratings and rankings, I mean, over 40,000 reviews in the colon cleanse is almost unheard of. So if you start poking around on amazon.com, which is what these are from, you'll see that our products are very highly placed. They're top sellers. They wear Amazon's Choices uh, brand, uh, you know, uh, and, and accordingly get very high placement in the segments so that uh, we're, we're very visible, very, very comfortable for consumers to, to make commitments to our product line. So while we certainly have a good number of, of repeat customers, it's important that when new people are considering your products and promotions that they see these kinds of reports from the, the consumer world. And as you may know, Amazon is extremely particular about protecting the, uh, the, lay, the way and the type of reviews that you get. It's not something you can mess with. Uh, anybody who tries to manipulate these finds themselves uh, in, in hot water in a hurry with Amazon. In fact, there's recently been some media attention to the fact that Amazon has been particularly stringent of late in terms of trying to knock down false reviews and claims. Uh, next, please, Trev. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the vitamin C serum is number one seller on Amazon.ca, has been for the last four years. This is one of the companies, the, it's an all natural advice product from the companies we bought in 2019. Maritime Naturals is the other company we bought in 2019. These two together, as you can see, are producing strong revenue growth. We have good EBITDA, we're seeing 29% growth year over year with these products. And, and again, uh, very popular segment. Consumers, we believe, are, are finding these products because uh, skincare is extremely important. Uh, particularly in an aging population. But moreover, people are, uh, we believe in many cases, fatigued by the extraordinarily high prices they see on some uh, more renowned brands. So they'll be able to look and compare and see a product that, like ours that's a, of high quality. Again, huge number of reviews and ratings, moderately priced. Uh, you know, sort of a value priced line, but containing ultimately the same ingredients that have more or less the same results as some of these much higher priced uh, brands that you would see. So these pro these two particular brands were a great tuck in for us. They uh, give us additional footprint, the uh, digital footprint in other parts of the world as they were selling already uh, heavily in Canada, Australia and Europe when we acquired them and we continue to see growth from those two particular brands. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is our 2020 year uh, in review on the right. So what you can see is since we took the company, uh, the original um, acquisition in 2018, you know, we went from 17 and change million. We're now reported over $40 million in sales in 2020, and about a $4.7 million EBITDA line. So we've seen growth. We, see, we expect continued growth and, and continued profitable growth as we continue with the global expansion that I referenced. Uh, next slide. Um, when we look at our total revenue, what you can see is there a little bit of seasonality, probably not surprising. Uh, you know, you, you get some peaks, uh, particularly in the online world. You may have heard of things like Prime Day, uh, Cyber Monday, Black Friday. These are all big and very popular events. 
Ultimately, though, what we're seeing is good stable growth, as you saw in the prior slide. We're stacking quarter upon quarter, whereby we're continuing to grow the business. And, and as we add these new portals and new jurisdictions globally, we see uh, the strong case for continued growth. We're also, as part of our strategy for the year and years ahead, looking at uh, selective M&A opportunities that come to us. We believe that, like the acquisition of the two skincare lines, we can, we can accelerate growth through the appropriate acquisitions as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is not, a, not an intent to attempt, rather, for us to compare ourselves to some of these highly recognizable brands you would see. But what we think is important and worth noting, uh, and it's sort of a, a reinforcement of my comments about scalability, our company operates with a relatively modest workforce. Uh, we have over $2 million in revenue per headcount. So our SG&A as a percentage of our overall is great and continues to improve as we grow. We believe we can, frankly, double our revenues without adding hardly any additional headcount based on the nature of our business. So what we point out here is that uh, there's an opportunity here for us to continue to drive significant revenue on a per employee base and continue to drive profitability as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, so I touched on in areas of focus for us moving forward. Our strategic overview is obviously we wanna capitalize on these trends that I've been laying out for you. We, are, we feel we're in a really great position uh, as an online seller of these value-based uh, wellness brands. We see strong industry tailwinds. I touched a little bit on, on the COVID pandemic. I'm sure you're all well aware that as people began to stay indoors en masse, they continued to, or started to in some cases, buy heavily online. You don't see those trends changing even post-pandemic. People now realize the convenience and ease of uh, online acquisitions, and they're gonna to continue to buy products in that way. We see tremendous opportunities continue to expand globally. There are many countries that we don't sell in today. We can move in in a matter of you know, weeks with, in some cases, uh, what I would call limited regulatory challenges. And I say that insofar as we know that the two, from a consumer products perspective, the two most challenging jurisdictions in the world to sell in are Australia and Canada in order based on the regulatory environments. And we're selling in both today. So from that perspective, we see the new market entrance as a bit of a, a downhill from a regulatory perspective. So we are confident that with the team we have, we can take advantage of those opportunities across the globe. And then uh, we're going to continue to offer new product launches, new families of products as we move forward. We launched about 12 products last year. We will continue at that kind of pace and cadence. We see opportunities to lay on new and innovative products that expand our, our portfolio. For example, in the last year, we launched a line of gummies, uh, hair care and uh, uh, nail, uh, elderberry, and uh, an apple cider vinegar gummy, all very popular, um, particularly poignant with American consumers, it seems, who like that particular format. But those are just some examples. Last year, we also launched a hand sanitizing product, as well as a whole bunch of others. The uh, beauty of not owning your own manufacturing assets is when we come up with innovative products to add to our portfolio, we can have them produced for us by third parties. So we can relatively easily add products. We added, as I say, a dozen in the last year. So we'll continue to do that. So again, the strategy is to grow through global expansion, through uh, organic growth, through product additions and, and, and pushing the products that we have. And then as I touched on previously, through M&A activity. Uh, I won't bore you with those details. Those are some of the products that we had launched that I touched on. And um, maybe if Andrew, if I could turn it over to you for a couple of minutes, there's Andrew, a patient or CFO, could talk a little bit about our capital structure. Sure. I'll just start briefly at the beginning um, by saying that um, uh, Mimi's Rock has never done a, a public capital raise. So the only uh, equity raise that we did was in July 2018 with the initial uh, acquisition of Dr. Tobias. Um, so we, we do suffer from a little bit of, um, I guess, uh, underexposure. Uh, that's a benefit, obviously, obviously, for people on this call. Um, however, uh, the, the share structure came about primarily as a result of that initial issuance. We did a, a 1.5 to 1 uh, reverse takeover transaction to go public through a, a capital pool company in May of 2019. And that uh, those shareholders retained about 3%. So it was, it was a very lucrative transaction for us. Um, and those are mostly the original shareholders as a founder group of approximately, it's about 40% right now. Um, there's some institutional holders, but there is a large retail component in there as well. Um, 
so going back to the original raise, it was done at a dollar a share, which at a 1.5 to one gives those people about a 67 cent cost base. So we do feel that, um, you know, those people, um, you know, will will see that value come back. We do feel that the stock is down for a number of reasons, mainly as a result of um, sort of some expectations and, and a couple of minor things that happened over the last, uh, like last quarter, for example, was not quite up to expectations. And when you're a company like we are with underexposure, um, you sort of get punished for those things. But the bottom line is that we are profitable, cash flow positive, don't need to raise capital. We will be opportunistic with our capital raises to fund the M&A. Um, but really, um, a relatively tight structure. Um, you know, we, we have the, the luxury of sort of, um, you know, planning our own capital structure going forward. We do have some debt. It's at a reasonable level, approximately 13 million of debt. So we feel that's a, a good balance. Um, but as we go forward and look to add to the top line revenue and margin to make the EBITDA percentages grow, we will be looking to do some M&A on a... Um, you know, on a, uh, on a smart basis, adding uh, some tuck-ins and just trying to, to build the overall revenue base that we have um, so that uh, the costs that we have make sense for, for the size of company that we are. So we're looking out for a 2021 where we can grow this quite significantly, both on organic and an M&A and change sort of that, that bottom line EBITDA number to something quite, quite substantially higher. Um, there is no immediate... Uh, uh, intent for a capital raise, um, as I mentioned, it is opportunistic, uh, but certainly we do feel that uh, once we do go to the market, there will be uh, some sort of, uh, I think, quite, quite some interest in Mimi's Rock, given that we've been two years without a capital raise. Um, did you want to get uh, into some other financials, Dave, or do you want to end there and sort of pass it over for questions? Um, well, I, I do notice there's a question coming in the chat. So I guess I would defer to Trevor and Paul to tell us from a protocol perspective how you'd like to proceed. Should we address that question? Or um, Sorry, I think you're if, on. Uh, yeah, I was on mute here. Um, if, you, if you're comfortable with the uh, presentation ending there, we can certainly jump, jump into questions. Um, I'll, I'll leave that part up to you. Okay. Sure, I think that's fine. I think that covers, covers the basics and then we're happy to entertain questions. Okay, perfect. Um, well, uh, I've got a couple questions um, that I'll start with and then we'll jump into um, you know the, the listeners' questions. And I want to remind everybody, if you do have a question for Dave or Andrew, uh, feel free to use the chat function and I'll do my best to, to ask the question. Um, so you guys, uh, I want to dive right into some of the stuff you mentioned about products and, and new products specifically. You've got a number of products out there already. Uh, you launched 12 last year, but how, how do you determine what, what product to launch next? Like, how do you guys go through the process of saying, okay, this is what we want uh, to, to, to market now? It's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, we frankly adopted a process that I, I had learned in my prior life around product selection protocol. So we have what's, what we call a pre-product selection process. We have a team that will look you know, to pop culture, frankly, to trends, to see what's going on in the world in terms of uh, consumer preferences. And we'll identify products or categories that we think are interesting to us. Uh, then we have a process by which those are presented and vetted. And we look at everything from uh, you know, the, the legal landscape, are these products that are patented, are they available to us? Do we have, uh, you know, a clear path to market? Can, do we have a, a supply partner or one in scope that we think it can make it for us to the specifications we want and so on? So we have a number of stage gates, one of which is, is market opportunity. So if we see, you know, in summary, a, a product that's of interest to us, where we see a path to market, where we see a partner that can make it for us and, and the financial opportunity is significant, it goes into our product review process. And then we find some of those things and, and ultimately coming out the other end, we make decisions to pursue products and to, uh, to launch them. Sometimes in multiple markets, sometimes in one market at a time, depending on particular item. So, you know, I referenced, for example, the gummy lineup that we launched last year, very popular format, uh, particularly in the United States. People seem to enjoy that as a method for getting their consumable vitamins. So we, we sourced a product and, um, you know, for those of you who've ever tried gummies or taken any particular products in that family, you would know that 
uh, gummies are susceptible to things like clumping and melting if not handled properly in transit. So we had to do our research to make sure that it was a good quality product available from a, a vendor partner who could produce it to our specs and to make it one that we felt we could stand behind. So anyway, we go through this process. Ultimately, we can launch a product from uh, you know ideation to launch in a matter of three or four months, depending on which uh, partner we're using and if it's an already established uh, manufacturing relationship. So we are constantly looking at lifecycle management. From in terms of both clipping the tail of products that we that we aren't having the kind of success we would like with, and adding new ones, I think it's important to point out that um, while we're not cavalier about it, we do have, a, as I said, a process. One of the great things about our business, and because we're not investing in manufacturing assets, is we can take some chances. We can take a swing of the bat, if you will, with a product that we think is going to be successful, in the knowledge that in the event that we miss the mark and it doesn't sell well. You know, your real your capital investment is the cost of your inventory and the manpower involved in getting it to market. And then, you know, so if we decided to clip a product, you know, we can sell it, we can do a blowout deal on it and, and get out of it without losing our shirts. So we like that part of the business as well. And I imagine when you, when you look at M&A, I, I would imagine you sort of take some of the same criteria or you look at it the same way. Uh, or, or maybe not. Maybe, maybe explain what you look for in a potential acquisition. Is it is it product? Is it you know existing sort of uh, revenue? Is it you know what can you tell us? So maybe we can tag team this answer. I'll, I'll let Andrew speak a little bit to the financials in a moment. But in terms of uh, the the types of products, I mean, we at this juncture believe that we want to stay within what we call the wellness lane. That's pretty broad. That includes obviously skincare, vitamins, hair care, all kinds of that sort of personal care type of product. Um, you know, we like products that are either A, being sold online, or B, are obviously capable of being sold online. And let me unpack that a little bit for you. Um, you know, when we look at the product families that we have, they're physically small embodiments. I mean, you're talking bottles and jars and things of that nature, which lend themselves well to shipping, stacking, uh, distribution, as opposed to the bicycles, on the other hand. I mean, you can sell them online, but it's a much bigger, clunkier item. So we're looking for products that, uh, that lend themselves well to being sold online and that are in the wellness lane, because we think it makes sense for our customers. And then we can cross sell between our brands and do promotions. You know, you may, hey, you trust us for this product. Why don't you try this one? And they make sense. There's a connectivity. And then from a financial perspective, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe let Andrew speak to that as well. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate it. So um, it's getting a little harder, I will say, and, and, and it's for a good reason. Uh, and that is the space uh, looking at companies that are Amazon centric um, players in that space. There's a lot of interest right now. I think uh, sort of the market over the last 12 months with everybody moving online has really realized that uh, companies that are positioned well on Amazon that can leverage that are attractive. And there's sort of been, um, you know, so, uh, I don't know, say a, a little bit of a maturing anyways and, and the development of that space and, and people realizing the multiples that they may or may not be able to get based on certain specifics of their business. But it comes down to, the, you know, that you do have to have good products and you have to have a good sort of core offering, which is sort of, the, you know, the, the, the operational piece of it. From a financial perspective, there's sort of a sweet spot there where you get a company that has um, developed a, uh, a product and, and you, you have um, an uptake and, and you've proven the model, if you will, and that the people like the product. And then what we're looking for is, is to Dave says, is the things that can, and, um, can operate well online. And then obviously have a structure for us um, acquisition wise that, that typically we, we would like that founder to, to, come over and have some transition time with us to be able to understand the business. It's not easy to be able to pass it off. We also um, are looking for something that we feel that we can add the value to. Obviously, we're not just looking to just slap on any product with just top line revenue. We need to feel that we can make a difference with that product. There are some unique aspects of selling online, particularly on Amazon, that go into um, deciding the type of product and, and exactly um, whether or not it's scalable to that level. And it's not just operational, it's also some of the financial things and, and whether they have the capacity, for example, with their manufacturing or with some of our opportunities to be able to scale it. So there are those things, but I find like it gets into the, a, a sweet spot range where it's sort of in the sort of two to $5 million. If it gets bigger than that, 
then people oftentimes want to carry on themselves and feel they can do a better job. There's lots of opportunities in that. We're sort of sorting through because it's hard to determine which ones are the winners and the losers, but certainly there's a lot of competition. Um, but we feel that, you know, we enjoy good margins right now. We have about a 70% margin. So we're looking for companies that have strong core uh, sort of gross margins at the product level because there is a investment in advertising that has to happen. So the financial model has to be able to account for that investment in advertising. You have to have the strong margin product in the first place to be able to leverage it properly online. And so um, it is sort of at, you know, in the product specifics and the scalability of those products. Um, and again, th there's a lot of competition. We have a lot of, um, I'm gonna say, uh, avenues for opportunities that come to us. Um, and we have developed a pretty good vetting process. Um, the, the types of things that we're looking for obviously are in the health and wellness lane, because that's what we know. And you can certainly advertise anything as Dave alluded to, but we feel that we have developed quite a bit of expertise in this area and we're looking to, to leverage that out. Um, you mentioned uh, marketing. How, how do you guys determine how much money to spend on marketing each product or, or you know, the, the brand or the, the different brands? How do you determine that, that number? Can I just jump in first? Because I think that just mm -hmm. leads me to one thing I wanted to mm -hmm. just maybe clarify that I had. And it's just the overall sort of kind of financial model of our products right now. I mentioned the margin, the gross margin is, is about 70%. When you're on Amazon, um, it's a marketplace. You know They don't take ownership of your product typically. They, they do have that function, but most of the stuff they do now is, is just as a third party marketplace. You manage all your inventory and you do all those things. Uh, when it comes down to promotion, um, there are all kinds of opportunities to do keyword searches. And, and so when somebody puts in a, a specific word, you bid for those keywords. And so you have to determine how much money you want to spend at what time and, uh, you know, at what sort of, in what sort of philosophy, I guess, in order to make that efficient. And then there's also the cost of actually being on the marketplace because Amazon fulfills and delivers and, and collects the funds for you. And you do have to pay that. That all is sort of considered part of your, selling and marketing expenses. So all of those things that come with part of, you know, operational components really do cost money and do need to be counted for as part of a marketing. So it is expensive on Amazon for those reasons. Um, but obviously, you know, they justify it because they get more traffic by a long shot than anybody else does. So are you willing to pay it? If you want to be successful, you need to have the margins to justify that and be able to do that. Maybe if I can add on to the, your question, Paul, was about how we decide on how much mm -hmm. or where to spend. Um, what I would take a second to explain that's, that's critically important with digital media, digital advertising, is that um, unlike traditional media, where, uh, for example, you drive down the road, you see a billboard for a product, you go, hmm, I might like to buy that, I go home and I buy it, the, the manufacturer, the seller really doesn't know why you're there. With digital advertising, there's attribution click-throughs, as you sometimes hear them called. So you see an ad, you click on it, you go there, you buy it, they can actually attribute the sale to that ad. So we get very specific data on, for example, return on advertising spend. So we now know, you know, when we spend a dollar on advertising, we expect about a 4.0 ROAS, or return on advertising spend, so we're going to get $4 in revenue on that. So it's something you can titrate in real time. So we can make adjustments, we're tuning constantly, are selling our advertising and we're seeing what's working and what's not working. So it's a very active, very hands-on, but there's a great deal of, of data that feeds back. So you can make those determinations in real time. Um, have you ever, and do, do you guys ever consider sort of walking into the physical side of the, the business? Like, are, are you always gonna be online or is there a reason to, to open up a physical store or to start selling through a, you know, uh, choices or, or, you know, whole foods. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. I mean, candidly, uh, as I touched on at the beginning, you know, my background is in more traditional consumer packaged goods. I worked uh, in OTC and pharma. We sold to the so-called big box stores, uh, mm -hmm. particularly in North America, all over the U S and Canada. Uh, so I'm very familiar with the channel. Um, it's not something we, we never say never, but what, one of the things I think it's important, and, and, and for me, it's a, it's a critical determination when I look at it, is that um, there's great alignment in the, for example, not all, I'll talk about Amazon for a moment in specific, but within the e-commerce world. And what I mean by that is 
Amazon's best product from their perspective is a high velocity, physically small, expensive item because they make the most money produce, or selling and operating in that space. Um, you know, if you think about traditional retail, you say you have a product and, and they love it and want to put it on the shelf and they're going to sell it for 10 bucks and you're selling it to them for three. The next day they want it for 275 and then 250 and so on because they can broaden their margins if they can pay less for the product and continue with that selling price where Andrew was touching on the Amazon ecosystem. They actually make a percentage of your selling price. So there's more, there's a more natural alignment there whereby if you keep the price high and sell lots of it, they love it. So they're not, we're not in this acrimonious relationship that some uh, vendor retailer relationships have evolved into mm. historically. So we really like the space and we see there's an opportunity, not only for all the alignment reasons I talked about and you know, those crossroads intersections, I'm gonna call them of, of society and technology that are mm. super aligned to this space, but the actual channel partners are aligned as well. So that's a long way of saying, we never say never. And in fact, we've talked to a number of, uh, of more traditional retailers and I, I touched on Walmart earlier. We now sell on Walmart, mm -hmm. but not on shelf at Walmart, just in their e-commerce play. But you know, if the right opportunity came along and we, we liked the structure of the, the deal and it made sense, we, we would look at anything. We're not gonna say never. But it's our core strategy. We still have lots of headroom from a scale perspective, just within the e-commerce platforms. That's uh, that's very interesting. I wasn't aware of the uh, sort of the alignment and the and the difference between the the two different stores, but it makes a lot of sense. Uh, one last question, and I'll, I'll turn over to a couple questions we've got from the listeners. Uh, but um, I, I've seen a number of companies come out uh, in your space that are talking about these sort of personalized subscription packages. Uh, for wellness products. Are you, do you guys ever look at that or are you already doing that or what, what can you tell us about that sort of stuff? Well, what I can tell you is it's, it's great marketing because it's not really personalized, for at least from where I sit. I think mm -hmm. what you see is the uh, companies will have, you know, typically a questionnaire and mm -hmm. they'll say, oh, you know, what do you need? What are your requirements? And then, and they'll steer you to a basket of products, which is predetermined mm -hmm. and they'll position it that it's, you know, it's highly specialized for you, which is mm -hmm. not, I don't mean to be, negative it's a, it's a brilliant marketing play we've looked at it we mm -hmm. actually started with some sachet products where we were bundling in you know in a daily dose package a number of popular and and uh, and commonly taken together products um the challenge of course is while it's a great idea the complexity that you bring into your operations is significant so we have not as yet taken that step we're monitoring it closely. We're certainly very aware of the types of companies that have done those things. And if if we see that tipping point whereby it, it makes sense for us, we can do it. We have manufacturing partners who have the ability to create uh, sachets, we call them the, you know, the little mm -hmm. uh, cellophane enclosures where you put a day's worth of product in it and you can sell it that way. So it's, uh, we have actually in our line, a couple of products like that, you know, men's essentials and stuff where you'd have you know, multiple products for a single day that you can throw in your travel kit when you're on the road or what have you. But um, uh, I don't know if I answered your question directly. It's something we've looked at and we'll continue you to monitor. At. at this juncture, we haven't uh, we haven't executed that yet. I'd just like to just make the one point though um, uh, there on the uh, the subscribe and save. So Amazon does have its own sort mm -hmm. of subscription thing. It's not the personalized thing, but they obviously have a subscription opportunity. We. Our products do very well in those subscription opportunities. So we, we can tell that we have a very strong repeat customer base as a result of that. We're one of the one of the highest subscribed, I believe, overall on Amazon in terms of the subscribe and save program for our fish oil products. So it's very popular and obviously it, it works well with the nature of what we what we sell because it's a regularly taken product that you can set an interval for that that just makes sense. And so uh, that has been successful for us. It's not quite what you're talking about, but it, it just reminded me to, to mention that because it's important for an overall marketing plan. Yeah, I, I just think it, your, your, your type of business lends itself to repeat orders, right? So any, anything sort of in that subscription category, whether it's personalized or not. Yeah, think, so uh, I'll, I'll give you a, some rates. So <clears throat> Amazon, the one thing with Amazon, the, obviously, uh, I, I don't know if we mentioned this specifically, but it's approximately just under 50% of all the e-com transactions go on Amazon right now. It used to be over that, it's just slightly under now. Um, so obviously they're getting the traffic, um, but you don't get as much customer data, unfortunately. They mm -hmm. are very protective of the actual sure. names, but you can yeah. get 
aggregate information. So the statistics that we do get from them, even though we don't have their names, show that our products are very, very well liked and very, you know, we have a lot of um, a strong sort of, um, uh, 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 what is it, a loyal customer base, let's put mm -hmm. it that way. So once we get a customer, you know, um, you know, we can afford to spend a little bit more when, when you can retain the customer because it's more, it's, it makes sense to do that investment. Mm -hmm. and, and it, I mean, it sounds a little bit underhanded because they're your marketing partner, but is there any way to sort of steer them directly to your, you know, your website or a different uh, yeah, platform? Yeah, it's, that... it's a constant battle. So uh, mm -hmm. we obviously have our own websites. We have a drtobias.com mm -hmm. and all natural advice and maritime naturals. They have their own websites and, and every Ecom play has the same uh, sort of uh, quandary, I guess. Do mm -hmm. I send my the people that I attract to the place where they're more likely to actually buy something, mm -hmm. even though you know I don't know who they are and I don't get their data and all those other things, or do I try to, you know, send them to my site? I get all their information, but they may not buy something. So you have to kind of weigh that. And and I'll I'll be honest, we kind of we do go back and forth because we are trying to build our own customer mm -hmm. base we do have a pretty significant list but you also want to do well financially and and the conversion rates that the actual people that actually buy once they get there is way way higher on amazon than any other site yeah that's my understanding as well okay well listen let, let's take a couple questions we've got two questions here um uh here we go have you noticed any changes good or bad from amazon's recent change requiring a lab approved certificate of analysis for all vns sold so um, that actually hasn't happened yet. And curiously, the, uh, the announcement that uh, John P, I guess, is referencing did come out earlier this year. And originally, it was supposed to be June the 7th. And Amazon, for those who are unaware, announced they were going to require a C of A from, at the time, originally, from an ISO-approved third-party lab. And ultimately, what that means, for those who aren't familiar with it, is that Amazon decided to implement a regulatory threshold which exceeds that of the FDA. That's interesting. This is Amazon.com where this happened, uh, although we expect it will cascade to other portals around the world. Um, so in simple terms, what for those who aren't aware, on the side of a, a vitamin bottle is a, what's called a drug facts panel, or basically it's the ingredients. And it'll say on there what's in it in what concentrations. And um, Amazon uh, believes that there are a good number of bad actors in this space and that people that were making false label claims and they were seeing that in their returns and customer complaint levels. So um, there's been a lot of talk, uh, in fact, more than talk in some cases about accountability and whether Amazon has responsibility. They say, hey, we're a marketplace, we're not accountable, but if somebody was to get sick or die or have an allergic reaction, there's questions about liability. So with all that said, Amazon made a determination that we're gonna put these rules in place. And they believed that it was gonna do a couple of things. One is it was going to eliminate the bad actors and make sure there was only high quality products being sold through their sites. And frankly, we also think that it was a, probably a play inspired by reducing some of their operational complexity because it's pretty easy to get listed on Amazon. And they, particularly in the last year, have seen tremendous number of inbound vendors trying to sell their products and list their products on their pages. So all that to say, uh, the Date for implementation did get delayed twice, actually, now. It's now pegged for the 28th of July. And we're excited about it. We think it's a good news story for Mimi's Rock and for our brands. We think that uh, it's going to do a couple of things. We think, on the one hand, it's going to create opportunities for us to grab additional market share because some of those bad actors are going to have their products delisted. We think it's going to create an increased level of consumer confidence in the quality of the products they're getting from Amazon. We think that's good. And ultimately, we believe that as one of the players who takes great pride in the quality of our products, this actually sets up well for us. We have a, all of our products now uh, have been approved. We have our CFAs in place. We're ready to go. Uh, we were ready to go when we originally thought this was going to happen. Um, but it was delayed from an operational implementation perspective from Amazon. So at the end of the day, we think it's a good news story. Interesting. Um, John also asked, can investors expect more uh, JV partnerships in the future, similar to the one with Avivagen? So, um, you know, one of the things I touched on when I was talking about our product selection process is that um, ability to get a product or products that we like created either through an existing partnership or through a new one. Now, the Avivagen partnership, for those who are unaware, Avivagen is a company that has a proprietary IP protected ingredient called oxybeta carotene, which is being used in feedlots 
So their primary business is for cattle, um, pigs and such. Um, as you may be aware, typically in farming operations, those types of animals are put on low dose antibiotics from birth in order that they stay healthy and can dedicate all their energy to growth and weight gain. Um, there's a growing concern about the amount of antibiotics in the food system. And so Avivagen, we thought was really interestingly positioned in that they had this sub uh, substitute product to antibiotics that's showing great promise and benefit for these animals. Um, we joint entered into a joint venture with them in order to bring our, our companion pet animal product to, to vitamin for primarily dogs and cats, but we focus on dogs, um, a pet chew which does great things for dogs, uh, hips, hair, skin. It's fantastic. Uh, I have a dog, he's on it, he loves this stuff. Um, but all that to say that, you know, we are always looking for innovative and interesting partnerships. So the one like Aviva Gen was a great example where we saw a product that we thought could be really interesting and beneficial for our consumers. We thought customers who are willing to take our fish oil, for example, would probably be willing to take a chance on our pet chew for their dog because uh, we all know they're members of the family. Mm -hmm. So we will find opportunities like that as they exist. One of the things we really like about that one in particular is, as I said, it's IP protected. So the competitive set is basically us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we have a challenge to differentiate ourselves from all the other myriad pet shoes out there, but we don't have to worry about somebody coming along and copying our good ideas. Uh, this is probably a question for uh, Andrew. Um, what's the status of the financial covenants of the senior secured facility? Sure. Uh, to just give a background on that, um, for those wondering where that question came from, we uh, were out of compliance in Q1 with our financial covenants as a result of a, a debt to EBITDA calculation. It has happened uh, in 2020, they gave us, uh, Scotia is our lender, they gave us uh, waivers then because they understand the, the reasons behind it and that it was a sort of an anomaly or a one-off and, and non-recurring. Um, the, the reasons for Q1 were, as we described it in the results, that uh, we had some FX impacts in there and we, we did make an investment in marketing that, that hurt the quarter. And as a result of that and the sensitivity of our covenants, we were slightly outside uh, Scotia has since granted that waiver, so we are now effectively in compliance, or we've been waived the compliance for that period, and we do expect to be back in compliance for two quarters going forward. We don't ever expect really any issues from Scotia. Uh, we've never missed a payment, never had any sort of kind of issues with the loan. It's just obviously they have these indicators there to kind of set warnings, and sometimes they go off for what we think are you know, reasons that they don't have to worry about. And obviously they don't, they don't feel that either. And they've given us waivers every time. Great. Good news. Um, last question here. Uh, have you looked into Crate Joy, which is a subscription box marketplace? You ever heard of that? Um, so I've heard of it. I'm not, I, I know um, in talking to our operational team, there's a couple of different uh, packagers that we have talked to. I, I apologize. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Crate Joy was one of them. Yeah, um, but I've certainly heard of it. What, for those who aren't familiar, these are third-party companies who will pack up, you know, whether it's subscription-based or, you know, a collection of products in a box that you can get on a monthly basis. So, ooh, surprise, I got my box of stuff this month. What's in there? Um, so there's lots of innovative marketing opportunities for us to consider and to look at, and, and we will absolutely exhaust those as we move forward. The reality is there's just so many opportunities for us in these different portals and jurisdictions that we kind of try and focus on the things that we think will have the biggest bang uh, for us in the long term. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I'm seeing so many different marketing uh, yeah. sort of platforms and everything for, for products. Uh, it's it's tough, to, tough to keep track. Um, listen, as, as investors, um, what sort of metrics do you think make the most sense for us to, to sort of watch and track to make sure you guys are executing on your business plan? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there first. Um, there was actually, I, th I thought we were on the last slide when we were talking earlier. There was one other slide uh, behind that, that that it was a bunch of uh, numbers and, and sort of comp uh, information relative to what we consider the closest comparative companies out there. Mm -hmm. the, the true answer is there really aren't many truly comparative companies right now that are public, right? And so what do you measure on and where are we relative to those? It's hard to say. What we focus on internally um, is trying to grow both our top line number and our EBITDA as a percentage and in real terms. So uh, if I can just sort of illuminate again, the, the business model at the beginning of the, 
the, the, uh, from the beginning was to buy a core business and then add on additional similar businesses. So we bought the Dr. Tobias business. We've added on a couple. We're continuing to add on to grow effectively a brand that is supported by a strong base. And we've put the base in and we're continuing to grow that top line. So um, as we go forward, is the top line growing? I mean, we do have some FX impact. So, you know, we need to, we talk about that in MBA. We can focus that out. But we're really trying to grow the top line both organically and by MA and grow the EBITDA line as a percentage. We feel as we get that top line, the EBITDA will reflect that same growth because our costs, our fixed costs are expected to remain flat as we go forward. So we do expect to grow you know, both revenue, EBITDA as a percentage and in real terms, and obviously earnings per share. So these are metrics that, that people should be able to follow relatively easily. There's, there are other ones within there that we will try to lean towards in some of our MDNA discussions in terms of you know, breaking it down by, by either country or, or market. But primarily, those are the main ones. I think those are the goals for, for 2021 is to, to grow those factors. Fantastic. Um, sort of the, the last question we always leave people with is, is more um, an opportunity to leave a parting message or, or anything that investors should, should look out for, uh, you know, in the, in the near future. Um, maybe a key takeaway that you want everybody to walk away with today. Sure. I, I guess what I would say is this. Um, the internet is not a fad and e-commerce is here to stay. Mm -hmm. And we believe we are extraordinarily well positioned uh, in that space and, and with that, that societal and technological change that's really happening across the developed world. We know that people are taking care of themselves and the opportunities in the health and wellness space online are therefore immense. And we look at the relative ease of scale, and I'm not saying ease, I'm saying relatively speaking, compared to most businesses, the ability to grow, to scale, to expand into other jurisdictions at a low cost is unusual. So we think this business can be $100 million in three years' time. We think we can do that with probably a $20 million EBITDA line. And depending on how aggressive we get in the M&A space, potentially more. So we see this as a really ground floor opportunity for investors. Uh, there's lots of challenges. It's never a straight line, but we, we believe heavily in the thesis that we've embarked upon. And we think that there's a great opportunity here to create some significant value. It's fantastic guys. I, I really appreciate, uh, coming, uh, and visiting with us today. If somebody wants more information, uh, what's your website address? Uh, Mimi's rock.com, www.mimisrock.com. We have an investor section there with our financials. We have the product list. You can connect through us. You can get an email through directly to me if, if uh, you have specific questions. Happy to talk to anybody. Very good. Very good. Um, okay, great. We've been speaking with uh, CEO David Kohler and CFO Andrew Patient of Mimi's Rock. Guys, I want to thank you again for joining us today and uh, good luck uh, as you guys progress here. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate, Appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Cheers.